Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here in this uh, um, strange day. Huh? I mean, um, it's better um, be few but interested than too many without interest. Let's put it this way. I'm very proud and honored to uh, introduce this conference, which is about uh, uh, creativity and imagination, creativity and imagination. And uh, um, I am very, very happy uh, for uh, the presence here of uh, Holy Mouth and Max Craven. Uh, they are uh, fabulous scholars and they wrote fabulous books. <laughs> yeah. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank Macro and all uh, its staff uh, in, uh, for uh, the hospitality and the support they kindly gave to this conference. Then I will also express my sincere uh, gratitude to Escuola Moderna uh, Ateneo Libertario, which has always been a source of inspiration and, spi and spiritual guidance. This event uh, stems from my uh, ever-growing interest in looking at uh, artworks, artists, and every artistic phenomenon through the lens of labor. So I have uh, recently come across two brilliant as well as shocking due to the scenario that they depicted books, art after money and money after art, but even, and against creativity by Holy Mouth. Although they uh, treat different subjects from different standpoints and with different eyes, uh, I see a strong and fertile connection between the lines of reasoning. In my vision, the two books are uh, intertwined because they both carry on an analysis on the relationship ever more ideologically impacted by the hegemonic narrative the relationship between the ideas of creativity and, creativity and imagination and their potential for a redemption from capitalist co-option. Am I clear? Thanks. As a matter of fact, the mantra of creative, uh, creative work helps neoliberal governments to impose austerity policies, policies pushing entire sectors of the civil society to do, to produce more with less. Thus, intellectual and artists easily become uh, accomplices of capitalism. It is uh, evident indeed that knowledge workers and artists are particularly exposed uh, to the degrading effects of uh, corporate creativity. On the other hand, art, as being and continues to be a vital organ in the development of capitalism, uh, with which it has always had a deep and ambiguous relationship. By continuing to believe in the romantic myth of, his, of art's allergy to money, art is a, a fetish, fetishized as a sacred kingdom profaned by capitalism. I hold this, this uh, image to you. And this fairy tale has harmful effects. In this sense, the artist, with his qualities of uh, inventiveness, enthusiasm, individualism, and initiative, has become a paradigmatic figure. The example of how every one of us can reconfigure his or her own subjectivity towards a better participation in the, in the market, adapting to the changing challenges of an era marked by risk. To put it as Cholet, uh, we are all here part of the dark matter, the hidden maze of a vast pyramid cemented by our own dreams, efforts, and hopes. The artist is no longer the insubordinate discontent, but the prototype, the champion of the efficient worker. You know, a few months ago, there was a Bifo here who had a, le who had a lecture, and he, 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 he scared us all. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Maybe, <clears throat> and maybe Bivo is right uh, in his gloomy prophecy, and we are all screwed. <laughs> maybe. But since uh, I refuse to give up without a fight, I didn't, that's why you are here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I need allies <laughs> in the resistance. So uh, I invite Oli to read the speech. So I'd like to start by uh, talking about um, JFK. So on May the uh, 25th in 1961, uh, the US President John F. Kennedy, pictured there, um, stood in front of Congress and he urged them to uh, aim to do the impossible. Uh, the USSR had uh, already been, had sent the first man and the first dog into space and the US were getting badly beaten in the space race. And he said these now famous words, which I'm sure many uh, of you know. He says, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Uh, and on July the, the 21st, 1969, 163 days before the end of that decade, uh, Neil Armstrong stepped out onto the moon and was safely back on the Earth three days later. And we were celebrating that 50-year anniversary earlier this summer. Uh, so not only had JFK and obviously his subsequent presidents after he was assassinated, not only had they fulfilled one of his most uh, ambitious promises, but they did so by uh, corralling a nation's imagination and their excitement, perhaps most importantly their tax dollars. Um, clearly the desire to go to the moon was fueled by a kind of ideological um, and military uh, warfare between the, the US and the USSR that nearly threatened to obliterate both of them during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. But really, JFK was able to take advantage of this heightened period of, I guess, nationalistic pride uh, to eke out more tax dollars from a, I guess, a traditionally quite a conservative country uh, to pay for a publicly funded space exploration program. Um, and I guess this, with this fuel of competitive nationalism, the US eventually triumphed. It succeeded in not only uh, envisioning one of the loftiest, most impossible goals ever by a national government, um, and not only in having the temerity actually to sort of, and the guts to proclaim this out loud uh, to the general public, and not only in managing to raise the required money via public funds, but it actually managed to do this in the stated goal in the given time frame, which if any of you have tried to deliver projects on time and on budget, you'll know how difficult that is. Um, it was a triumph of the collective imagination, uh, of the collective creative imagination to propel humanity onward on its journey of civilization to the moon and beyond. But perhaps uh, it was the last. Uh, because what isn't clearly a deliberate reference to the moon landings, uh, there's an Alphabet company. Alphabet are the parent company of Google. Uh, there is an alphabet company simply named X, and they describe themselves as a moonshot factory. So emanating from the Silicon Valley sort of modus operandi, X have um, a blueprint for multiple moonshot projects. They, uh, they quote here, they look for the intersection of a big problem, a radical solution, and breakthrough technology, end quote. Uh, their projects include things like driverless cars, online access to millions of people, of unconnected people via uh, internet-enabled balloons that hover in the atmosphere, uh, delivery drones, contact lenses that can sort of help us see augmented reality, and a host of kind of machine learning products which are beginning to come to the market today. Um, so these projects, these things, in and of themselves, I guess, can do wonderful things for communities and cities and people all over the world. They can make roads safer. Um, they can get millions of people online. Um, and give them access to information. They can move things around uh, quicker without the need for sort of cost costly infrastructure. And of course, they, can, they would allow our eyes to see more than just sort of the immediate things around us. Uh, but, but the fact that they're being thought of within the confines of a trillion dollar corporation suggests that their implementation will be anything but democratic. And I think what's more, by the sheer economic force, the X-Lab is eclipsing all other public projects in universities or indeed government research labs that are attempting to do similar things but on much smaller budgets. So given that X stems from the financial might of Alphabet and Google, 
They have room to experiment and room to fail. Um, they can attempt extremely risky and inventive ideas, and again, quote, whether it leads to the simplicity of a fine invention or the mess of failure. But as evidence that such experiment is kind of yoked to a financialized motive, um, X actually rewards team members that shut down the projects that are likely to fail. Uh, so for all this big thinking and idealism about world-changing inventions, their bottom line is ultimately what counts. And that X are now at the forefront of the planet's latest invention paradigms uh, demonstrate, to me anyway, just how intricately linked creativity with its most radical imaginations and the overarching epoch of our time, i.e. capitalism, have become. Um, I think all this means that the most ambitious creative ideas that humanity has imagined have been commandeered by capital. Um, I think last year, 2018, was the 150th anniversary of the publication of Das Kapital by Marx, uh, in which he detailed the enclosure of the commons. Uh, and we now see space exploration uh, becoming a private enterprise. Artificial intelligence almost exclusively being developed by corporations, although not completely. Entire cities being built without any democratic or community involvement at all. And perhaps most damaging of all to our species, uh, the way to beat climate change is apparently just to sort of have more privatization and more consumption that has got us into this state in the first place. And, you know, the ridiculousness of Banksy's latest stunt last year uh, shows how uh, the market is completely inadequate to value creativity. I'm not sure if any of you saw this uh, in, um, in London. It, this was a Banksy product that went on to auctions in Sotheby's, and he meant for it to be shredded as it was as the hammer went down. Ult I, I guess ultimately to make it invaluable, but it didn't work. It only I shredded half of it, and it actually the price went up after it happened. So you know the value here is you know I guess the whole point of the market just is inadequate to value particular kinds of social creativity. So. We're nearly half a century on, in fact, we're over half a century on from when Neil Armstrong proclaimed mankind has made a giant leap. Uh, but now, any giant leaps we make are directed by private capital. Uh, creativity has been privatized by capitalism, as you can see here that Adidas are so keen to tell us. Uh, what is more, I think it's after our collective imagination. Capitalism attempts to stop us from believing the impossible, or at the very least, it reconfigures our imagination so that any realized impossibilities must be profited from first. As the British uh, political theorist and sociologist Mark Fisher so uh, eloquently argued, the capitalist realism of the 21st century has meant that the possibility of an alternative form of creativity and societal organization beyond capitalism has all been foreclosed uh, by an all-pervasive kind of monetization of life to the chorus of there is no alternative, that classic kind of Thatcherite uh, motif. So what I'd like to do is to think about that kind of creativity, um, that, let's call it um, a big C creativity with a capital C, um, the one that has been commandeered by capital. And in this version of creativity, everyone is encouraged to be creative in our work life, in our neighborhoods in which we live, in our schools, in our leisure time and in our cities. We are bombarded by messages that by being creative, we will live better, more efficient, self-gratifying, enjoyable lives, and we can build more inclusive, democratic, smart, and user-friendly cities. Um, line managers, CEOs, urban designers, teachers, politicians, urban mayors, lecturers, advertisers, even our friends and our family, the message is be creative and all will work out for the better. Um, they eulogize that we live in creative times and we are encouraged by thought leaders uh, to free ourselves from the shackles of bureaucracy, centralized power, and social straitjackets, and unleash the inner creative entrepreneur inside of us all. Uh, and in so doing, we will create brand new creative spaces and products that will empower us to lead better lives. So work life is geared around being creative. Indeed, it is a characteristic that is demanded of almost all of our jobs. From bankers to fast food attendants, from builders to nurses, if you scan any job description online these days, um, there's the creativity or creativeness will be kind of listed under essential characteristics or some version of that word, be it innovative, artistic, and entrepreneurial. Um, Subway, you know, the, the fast food outlet 
Subway um, recently called their attendants um, uh, sandwich artists as opposed to just kind of... So that sort of thing. Um, creativity uh, is kind of heralded, therefore, as being sort of uh, celebrating flexibility, mobility, and it allows us to kind of work seemingly independent, uh, independently, I guess, from the wishes of our bosses. Uh, we often work in kind of funky offices with slides and ping-pong tables, and sometimes not even to have an office at all. We can work in a cafe or a dedicated workspace, places like WeWork and all these other large companies that are doing that sort of thing. And it's shunning, I guess, William White's organisational man um, to ever more sort of radical and individualistic ways, and that's kind of now the norm for contemporary labour models, even beyond the creative industries. So to, that's kind of within work. So to be a creative person, we are told to be mindful. We're told to go for long walks or go for a run to get our creative juices flowing, or take a meditation class to clear the stress of your job or your home life. I guess ultimately, in doing so, you may be able to emulate Mark Zuckerberg's of this world, and maybe, just maybe, if you open up your non-work life to work-like thinking, you will find that killer idea that will make you a multi-billionaire. And even within our politics, creativity is more important than ever. The creative industries and the creative economy are now prized assets politically, and even government policy has to be creative. Uh, from the lexicon needed to implement um, austerity in the UK and across the EU, uh, to selling Brexit to the masses, uh, politicians force us, and indeed are asked to, be more creative in how they adapt to the ever-changing world that they seek to control. And within our cities, the urban space has been reconfigured to be more creative via the relentless development of novel and agile place-making schemes, from small-scale interventions like parklets uh, to entire neighbourhoods being raised to make way for um, a smart city or an every kind of pop-up shop or creative city incubator or cultural quarter in between, contemporary cities, really, they're, they're awash with, with schemes and policies that have been implemented in the name of making a place more creative. Now, don't get me wrong, this is, I think, can be an important message and one that has a great deal of benefit, I think, for businesses and communities on, on some level. Um, you know, it is having an effect on education in schools to some degree and in some cases is actually improving public services. But I don't think there's any escaping that there are major, major, major problems with this um, kind of big C creativity. Because the jobs that they're creating are becoming so flexible and so much more precarious than ever. Social security, in-work benefits, welfare have been slashed. Entire creative business models such as the gig economy and zero hour contracts are driving down wages, um, driving up instability and all the problems that that creates with um, deterioration of mental health, of low productivity, and of job satisfaction. Um, the atomization of labor um, is kind of decimating union power uh, and eroding any sense uh, of a socialized working environment. Although I must add, there has been some backlash to this. Um, in the UK, there was recently the creation of a computer games union, which has been quite well celebrated in many circles. But really, releasing this kind of inner creative or the inner entrepreneur is such an ingrained mantra that it is forcing us to kind of close down collaborative forms of creative action. It is deadening social relationships and feeding a loneliness epidemic. I think what is more, it kind of fails to take into account the massive social privilege that this kind of creativity is built upon. So being a person of colour, being a woman, being LGBT, being disabled, being working class. There are massive social barriers to marginalized peoples becoming the next Mark Zuckerberg, which just aren't factored into this narrative of anyone can make it. And within our politics, create, being creative often means doing more with less, which is a pseudonym for allowing efficiency savings or cuts. Um, outsourcing of key social services to private companies, particularly in healthcare, is causing massive problems and has, direct, has been directly linked to thousands of deaths. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about the shambles that is Brexit. We were supposed to not be in the EU. The UK was... I, I was worried that I might not be able to come today because my passport might not have made it through. I don't know. Luckily, we are still in the EU and long may it continue. Um, but Theresa May, when she was in charge, and I think Boris Johnson has said this as well, they wanted to think, people to think more creatively about a deal. But what that really means is just 
to allow for the current destructive path of reducing regulations, empowering corporations and reducing welfare and environmental regulations as well. To just all that simply get worse. So too often creativity is a kind of political buzzword used to push through kind of existing polities and to maintain the damage that they cause, but often just gives them a, a new language, I guess. Um, and then the cities that are creative under the creative city mantra, they will often be private, where acts of protest, rough sleeping or street vending will be criminalized. Um, they are often very secure, they're securitized, they are militarized with private guards, CCTV and or defensible or weaponized architecture. Um, but more broadly, I think these cities contribute to the gentrification of the city, which is obviously massive deleterious social issues, including you know, rocketing rental prices, the displacement of marginal subjects, and the homogenization of space. So for me, this kind of creativity, uh, this kind of, uh, this big C creativity, we need to champion a, another form of, of, of it, another form of creativity with a small C perhaps, a creativity that doesn't replicate these existing forms of society, namely capitalism and the injustices that it is imprinted upon the world. Uh, the last uh, century or so of capitalism has ushered in kind of in untold inequality, global epidemics of starvation yet also obesity, uh, has dangerous rise of a globalised far-right fascism, and perhaps most pressing of all, a complete climate catastrophe. Uh, and of late, the rhetoric of creativity has really been at the sharp end of a lot of these kind of ideas. So I think we need to radically rethink what we mean by creativity, and we need to ask what is it that we're actually creating, with an emphasis on the we. Is it simply just more of the same? Is it simply more of the same structures and inequalities? Or is it a fairer, more sustainable and just world? So within work, within politics, within city, and within the other realms of life, uh, there are new ways of being uh, that we can look at. What kind of new, way, new ways of living could there be? So using those four lenses, uh, work, people, politics, and the city, i just like to go through some examples, really, and to argue that there are other forms of kind of a revolutionary kind of creativity out there that could offer a real alternative, if only they could be built upon, perhaps, and enlarged to some degree. So within work, <clears throat> so within the realm of creative work, I'm not sure if you, uh, many people here are involved in creative work, I'm sure we are, uh, it's the, the precariousness and the, the precarity, I guess, that it proliferates um, there are many traditional forms of uh, organizations of, of labor protection that try to rally against this kind of co-opted power of the corporations. So it's like trade unions are the classic example here. But they tend to be very reactive. They will often only look to restore working conditions of the exploited back to normal conditions. Um, a lot of the hard-won um, hard uh, conditions that unions have are being eroded, so they look to try and restore them. Uh, so I think what's required are new ways of organising work that kind of totally reject this normality in the first place. I mean, there are countless examples of cooperative working arrangements that kind of unionise in far more democratic ways uh, than, than a union does. Um, and they kind of do this to push back against the mode of capitalism that sees some workers as kind of disposable uh, and meaningless. Uh, they make the smooth functioning of uh, capitalism's exploitation and marginalise, they kind of they disrupt it. They make it far more difficult to kind of co-op them. Um, by treating all workers equally, these co-ops, um, uh, they kind of agitate capitalism and they agitate the exploitative model. They problematise it and they disrupt it. Um, there's a really good uh, example, the Mondragon University in um, Spain, I'm not sure if any of you know this. This is a sort of cooperative model in which the management structure is made up of a group of about 30 people. It consists of students and early career staff. It has a flattened pay structure, and no staff in the university earn more than three times the lowest wage. Um, and each staff buy into the university after working for two years, uh, an investment that can be taken out upon retirement. Um, in addition, all staff can see each other's expenses, which uh, uh, in the UK, at any rate, would be, would be very problematic, I think. Uh, and departments help to bail each other out financially if they struggle to attract funding. Uh, as I say, in the UK, we have very obscene levels of salary from um, 
our VCs, the people at the top. So I think this would be a, a welcome change, to, particularly in the UK. Um, and then you can look at people like the, the Recuperadas in Argentina. They're a cooperative and uh, they took sort of cooperative and communal labor practices to even more radical degrees back in 2001, when after the, the Argentina's um, devastating economic crash, um, workers actually reclaimed the factories, they fired their bosses, uh, and implemented a, a very flat and horizontalized pay structure and a management uh, by committee. This is an example, of, I guess, of what um, Henri Lefebvre would call autogestion, uh, and could be seen uh, in other forms of social organization, such as squats, uh, humanitarian refugee camps, and even in civic government. Uh, just today, I was reading, again, that in the UK, they've called for a citizens' assembly around um, climate change, so there's going to be people that will be... Um... So again, it, 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 it attempts to try and think about horizontalized structures. Um, in Athens, in Greece, uh, in response to very deep austerity by the EU, um, unemployed people set up uh, time banks where labor and services were exchanged depending on the time spent rather than monetary value. And I think this, what this does quite well, and I think quite importantly, uh, is that it foregrounds those services that are penalized under austerity, things like care, craft, social services. Um, and they create labor exchanges is kind of unmediated by money. And we have the similar things in the UK, time banking UK, I'm sure within Italy as well, there are similar kinds of ideas. So given the radical democratic processes that these can exemplify, can they be scaled up? Can they be protected uh, from co-option by capitalist schemas? Well, uh, defending the traditional labor model at, against attack is important, but this will only um, work um, if we continue to explore more viable and more radical alternatives that continue to disable and problematize the accumulation of capital. You know, we have to continually disrupt this process. Work is fundamental to our innate humanity. We all have the desire to produce something, to create, be that things that sustain us, entertain us, or just even bring us closest together. But as Karl Marx and many others have stressed since, Capitalism co-opts the value added for its own, and the societal wealth of those products is not realized until it has passed through the, the market. And ultimately, that sees the value flow centrally. So that creativity that is innate to us all goes towards kind of bloating the wealth of the elite few. Uh, but within these examples in Spain, Argentina, and Greece, and in other places such as Brazil, um, there's a radical version of creative work, and we can see what it looks like. I think replicating it, adapting it, and scaling it up is what's needed to resist capitalism's erosion of social uh, and communal value of work. And I think this is a revolutionary creative act because it exposes the injustices of a capitalist labor system, and it points towards, and it even realizes, a more collaborative horizon free from the restraints of exploitative waged labor. Um, it highlights that within the cracks of a capitalist system, there are green shoots of revolutionary change. Um, and by shunning the individu individualism that creative work champions, uh, self-managing collectives um, and all the hard work that goes into maintaining them, uh, sort of realize an actually existing common labor model, one in which all workers are treated as equals, no matter if they're a cleaner or indeed a creative. Um, so moving on to people, what, are, what about a creative person? What about creative people? Who are the real creative geniuses of our society? Um, you know, we can think about Steve Jobs and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and these other creative types. They are eulogized, um, maybe not Elon Musk, but others are eulogized only insofar as they have not had to sort of fight off institutionalized prejudice. Uh, in many cases, they feed off the creative works of millions of other people. Uh, they have a sort of particular identity politics, uh, which is more often than not privileged, white, male, middle class, and able-bodied Westerners. Um, they're able to create, or sorry, they're able to be creative because they are not using their sort of creative energies to simply fight off everyday injustices that they will really never have to face. Um, there is a socialized world around them to feed, to clothe, and to entertain them, and they've not really ever had to use as I say, any ounce of their productive energies to fight off institutionalized sexism, racism, or ableism. Um, furthermore, we are told to rely on the self as the sole proprietor of change in the world. Um, 
embodying the now kind of common neoliberal kind of Thatcherite trope, focusing on your own interests at the expense of others is the only way to get ahead. Realizing the creative person inside every one of us is how we will progress as a civilization. Uh, but a, such kind of intense individualization, I think, blinds us from the social world that contributes to the imposition of that privilege. It hides and actually attempts, and it actually attempts to destroy the ties that bind us together and the social world that provides for us. So I think riffing, riffing on um, people like Deleuze and Guattari and their work on sort of becoming minor, we can redefine the image of a creative person. So I think we need to turn to the margins of society, in particular for me anyway, looking at the work of disabled people and the artistic practice that they engage with and place them almost at the forefront of society. Um, the worldly experience of the majority of people in which capitalism is kind of completely familiar with. You know, advertisers know how to sell things to the normal body. Um, creative technology producers are familiar with what kind of new apps, I guess, and video games will be appealing to the everyday homogenous consumer. Fashion designers know what kind of clothes someone of the same mind might want to buy. But when those people that are not of the majority, these minor subjects, ex they experience the world in very, very different ways or if they have different kind of mental and sensorial capacities to everyone else, then suddenly normal capitalist procedures become very, very unstable. So I think disabled people, people with neurodiversity and physical impairments, will experience the world in ways to which capitalism is ultimately blind. So we can look at things like deafness, synesthesia, even things like Tourette's syndrome. This is um, a cartoon up here by an, uh, an artist with Tourette's syndrome. They are all conditions that kind of allow people to experience the world that others simply cannot access. Now, don't get me wrong, there's oppression here, of course. These people are systematically disabled by the workplace, by the city, by governments, and by their everyday encounters and personal relationships. But I think such oppression can come simply from the language that is constructed. So, for example, hearing loss. What, what would happen if we change that to deaf gain? What is there to be gained by being deaf? as opposed to what do we lose by not being able to hear. How would a different approach, one that is based on, I guess, the social model of disability, that views disabilities as something to be learned from rather than something to cure, lead to spaces and systems of equality? What if we adapted our institutions, our cities and our workplaces and tailored them specifically for disabled people? What would they look like? How would they transform these spaces? The, um, there's a blind architect called Chris Downey. Uh, he was born seeing, but he went blind later in his adult life. And he has said that his unsighted experience of the city is far more sensory than his sighted experience ever was. The feel of the sunlight on one side of his face or the smell of different shops, the changing audio landscapes of the city, he says, are far more vivid than when he was sighted. And indeed, he goes on to argue that the city needs blind people. If a city is designed with blind people in mind, then urban streetscapes suddenly become more walkable and more accessible. And it also encourages people to, to look out for one another. Um, you know, the, the, all of this stuff wouldn't have been known to him had he not gone blind. So with the current narrative of creativity, everyone, is, everyone is, of course is creative, but only those who have made it, i.e. those with the privilege, have the luxury of socially and financially profiting from that creativity. But what they are really creating is just simply more ways to maintain that division. So I think resisting this division, inverting it, and kind of empathizing with each other and those on the margins negates this deleterious form of creativity and proves a new way is possible. So sharing experiences, stories, we can collaboratively journey into more uh, just and equal worlds. And um, there's a quote Chris Downey says, he says that there are two types of people in this world. There are those uh, who are disabled and those who have yet to find their disability, which I think is quite poignant in that respect. Um, so moving on to politics, what if we demanded a sort of more radically creative form of politics and indeed a more version, creative version of the state? What if we could recalibrate creativity to mean altering the way that politicians behave or indeed having the need for politicians at all? What if being politically creative meant abolishing the current system and coming up with an entirely new form of politics, something which people are looking to now these days with the way that it's going? Um, 
For example, if sortition is good enough for our legal system, why is it not considered for our politics? What would a political system look like that was solely committed to changing society so a government was no longer needed? Um, there are alternative political models out there being practiced today. So this is Chiran in Mexico. It's a small city um, near the border. And it was riddled with um, an illegal cr uh, logging crime syndicate and very, very corrupt local politicians, not unlike many other places around the world. Um, the locals um, had enough and they took matters into their own hands. They um, refused to partake in local elections. The political campaigning was completely banned um, and the police were all fired. Um, and a lot of this movement was led by, by the women of the city. And there's, you can go online and there are some documentaries about this city. Um, and there are people, uh, there are citizens with quite large weapons on the outskirts of the city and they, they check every car that comes into a car. It can't even have a political bumper sticker on the back of a car. It gets told to take it off. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, but over a course of a few years, they forced out the loggers and the whole city just, re they even refused to vote in the presidential elections of, Me of the Mexican presidential elections. That was in um, 2011. Uh, now the loggers are completely all gone. The trees have been re replanted. The city is governed by local people via sortition. Um, if you don't, sortition is when you pick lots, when you pick a government or a group of people simply by lottery and the government, you just then have to govern for a six months, 12, uh, 12 months. So th the local people are selected by a sortition, crime has dropped, and the quality of life has, ma has massively improved. There are other examples of this kinds of politics, particularly in Latin America. Porto Alegre in Brazil is um, introduced participatory budgeting in 1989. Um, and apparently within the first 10 years, 75% uh, more homes were connected to water and sewage systems. The number of schools quadrupled and the health, sanitation and education levels of some of the poorest people in the city improved massively. Apparently now there are over one and a half thousand cities and neighborhoods that implement a kind of form of participatory budgeting, which is a very democratic form of deciding where uh, local money gets spent. Um, and there are other examples of local communities creating alternative political systems that attempt to foster an engagement with communities to effect a change, I guess that would otherwise just simply not come about. And in such cases, everybody, or a lot more people, have the opportunity to speak and to act. They kind of, they remove the politics of disavowal and despair and they shorten the distance uh, between a specific desire for change and actually realizing that change. So is it any wonder that they're gaining traction all over the world? Um, you know, the current political regimes across uh, the Western world are clearly rapidly polarizing. We know this. Um, I was just talking to the others about the UK general election where we've got a hard right and a hard left and we have nothing in the middle anymore. Uh, the, we've got the rise of far right groups across Europe and indeed far right presidents in the United States. And of course, their socialist-leaning oppositions has stretched the mainstream. So a lot wider, I think, than it ever has been, perhaps since the end of the World War II. And this has led, led to much anger, to disenchantment, and to people taking to the streets in the form of mass protests, marches, riots, artistic practices, civil disobedience, and direct action, like the Extinction Rebellion people that I was spending some time with uh, over the last few months. Um, and many of these people are using a very different version of creativity to make their political point. Um, within the Extinction Rebellion, uh, we saw they had put on theater performances, they provided dance classes, they had community gardens, there were even uh, religious church services and baptisms, all within the confine of a protest movement that is protesting the environmental injustices of capitalism. And indeed, it was Extinction's Rebellion, one of the... Uh, demands of Extinction Rebellion was to set up a citizens' assembly to combat climate change, and so these are beginning to come to fruition. So within this current milieu of sort of protests and activism from Hong Kong to Chile, uh, well, you know, based in the world of political oppression, it highlights obviously a real desire for systemic political change and the redressing of, of capitalist systems. And I think marbled through this complex web of political tensions, we have clashes of ideologies, uh, of government instability, and of course, you know, the everyday violence that that perpetuates via 
austerity, we can see sort of fissures of revolutionary political possibilities and they can be actually viscerally experienced. I think capitalism's exploitation of and its violence against uh, the marginalization as it increases those very same spaces, I think the seeds of creative political revolution are beginning to be sown. I mean, what were once seen as political impossibilities, say, for example, a socialist in number 10, or indeed you know, the White House, they're suddenly becoming very, very real possibilities. Um, and finally, what about the city? So, you know, creativity is so ubiquitous in urban development protocols across the global north and indeed the global south that it is almost invisible. Um, every new building, plaza, center, quarter, zone, district, it's sprinkled with creativity in the hope that it will attract uh, the creative class and the all-important economic growth that they bring. These cities are colored in cool, bohemian, and artistic hues, uh, and the new city formula of our time kind of necessitates a vernacular of creativity. We have people like Richard Florida and Charles Landry to thank for that. But like this um, creative summer party in Shoreditch in 2018, uh, they are often exclusive, they're elitist, overwhelmingly white, and devoid of any particular engagement with the minorities of these local communities. Um, despite Shoreditch's rise to prominence, it is still one of the most deprived areas of London. Um, what does a creative city look like that isn't any of this? How can, urban, how can urban creativity that is embedded in the everyday resistance to the hegemony of capital be rescued from the co-opting forces of this kind of creative city. Um, there are a multitude of resistant practices from militant working class groups to playful interventions via institutions that follow more official lines of protest. And all of these groups and actions have their place, I think, in the spectrum of resistance. Um, throughout Europe, um, I'm, I'm very sorry, this looks a little bit like a holiday snaps slide. I didn't mean it to, but it does a bit. So I apologize. But, Throughout Europe, I've kind of been lucky enough to visit a number of sites that are carving out their own space of subversive community-focused creativity out of the modern city. Um, the most famous, perhaps, is Christiania in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, after the army left the barracks, a derelict in 1972, squatters took over this site and have successfully fought off attempts to close it ever since. Um, it has no private property. It has its own set of rules. Um, for example, if you've been to Christiania, you'll know that you can uh, buy soft drugs legally in the street. wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Um, and it's often a, a refuge for many outcasts in the city. And indeed, I'm uh, I've, quite exciting. I've been in, in, in selected as the academic in residence next year for Christiania. So I'm going to be going there quite a lot, which will be fun. Um, so Christiana is one uh, example. Grow he throw. Uh, on the top right there, is just outside of London, near Heathrow Airport. It's an eco-squat set up around 10 years ago uh, to protest against the building of a new runway at Heathrow Airport. Since then, it's grown into a small community of marginalised people who live completely off-grid, completely sustainably and completely creatively. They even you know, recycle everything, everything, including their own waste. Um, can Mass do in Barcelona? I was there recently. They have a similar setup. They allow um, schools and businesses uh, to, to come in and see how they operate. We've got Cooley in Berlin, uh, which is an artistic community uh, who to commandeered a building back in the 90s um, after reunification of the city. And it has remained a space for sort of queer, anarchist, and feminist performing arts communities ever since. Although it has uh, been gentrified a little bit now. They've, they've had to officially kind of change their status a, a bit. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are kind of shades of grey here as well. It's not all just co-option or not co-option. There are other kinds of ways it can be done. Um, and then there's the um, the example of the um, iconic um, skate spot in London's South Bank. So I, I apologise. I'm using a lot of examples from London. Obviously, that's my um, site of research. But um, in 2013, um, one of the UK's, and indeed the world's, most iconic um, skate spots um, was um, uh, part of the, it's part of the South Bank Centre, which, was, as you know, if you've been to London, it's a very large cultural institution near the river. And they announced plans to convert this space 
under the Hayward Gallery, this is the Undercroft area, they wanted to kick out the skateboarders and turn it into retail outlets. Um, the skateboarders have been here since the 1970s. Um, and it's, as I say, one of the most well-known and revered skate spots in the world. And understandably, the reaction to this by the skating community was, uh, was swift. Uh, the campaign, uh, Long Live South Bank campaign, uh, to save the Undercroft, it achieved its goal, to cut a long story short, it achieved its goal of stopping the demolition of the skate spot through um, a combination of official protesting campaigning. They had the largest ever official planning objection in UK history. You see these boxes on the bottom right? They were all filled with single file um, planning applications and they were skated that every, every skater picked up a box and skated from here down to the council offices in a very big, long march all the way down the road. It was very good. Um, so they had official activity, but they also had clandestine activity. For example, they had undercover filming of private meetings, uh, and they had obviously artistic and creative practices as well. Um, and like I say, to, to cut a very long story, a very interesting story, one which I have written about in other books and articles. Uh, in 2015, the South Bank Centre cancelled their plans. It was actually Boris Johnson, believe it or not. Boris, one of the very few thing, good things he did was to make sure that this was cancelled. Anyway, I think it's, it's an important event in London's cultural politics, and it actually sent shockwaves through the uh, city's uh, creative industrial sector. I think it was significant because it showed how subcultural communities can mobilize themselves in a largely leaderless collective to take on and defeat gentrification plans by a cultural institution. And I think it was also cru crucial because it highlights how alternative and subcultural spaces can exist alongside commercial entities without being constantly threatened by the gentrification powers of the creative city. And there are many other examples I could give from housing, public space, to retail, to local fruit and veg markets. So in the city, to be radically creative, I think, is to see connections and potential ways of augmenting each path with the other. Um, to collaborate in opposition is not easy, and it requires patience, it requires forgiveness, it requires temperance, and a great deal of emotional energy. And such things are obviously in very short supply in the current suffocating environment of the urban neoliberal capital, capitalism. Um, and I think this is because the current articulation of the creative city with the big C does nothing other than continue this kind of gentrification, the displacement and its violent dispossession. Um, and of course now with this, we have a sort of nefarious process of art washing where property developers use artistic practice to make a place seem more desirable, the artists and the creative personnel at the leading edge are being used as, as foot soldiers, if you like, of this change. Um, and I think a lot of these artists, because they've been hemmed into the precarious life by an incessant narrative of creative work, artists and creative institutions, they don't really have any option but to work alongside developers and urban councils and I guess the hope is that their political message gets heard above the noise of the inrushing capital and it lasts long enough to make some sort of difference. Um, this is the example uh, of the Balfour Tower, oh sorry, the, um, yeah, the Balfour Tower in East London. It was given an artistic makeover uh, to make it more amenable to the professional classes. It was a social housing block. Um, the tower was used in a photographic exhibition by Simon Terrell uh, and it it was also the setting for a, a gritty retelling of Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, via kind of an immersive theater experience. Um, other tactics that weren't used at Balfron, but in other areas, include um, famous street artists giving a place, sort of a veneer of edginess and sort of cool. Uh, so it will be featured in like Time Out magazine and then attract the bohemians and the creative class. And obviously this is straight out of the um, Richard Florida playbook. Um, and I guess areas like this that are traditionally working class and or council estates are designated either through official narratives or more stealthy kinds of tactics. They're designated art districts to attract the right kind of people. Um, that this, this building, the Balfour, had stunning panoramic views 
over London and is less than, less than a mile from Canary Wharf, I'm sure that's got nothing to do with it. Um, and other sites that can be said art washed or co-opted by official more forms. So this is Hamilton House in Bristol at the top. Um, it was a community centre with a cafe, with art classes, with a drug rehabilitation programme and really catered for the homeless and marginalised people in Bristol. Uh, in 2018, it fell into the hands of private developers who continued just to keep that kind of grungy aesthetic, but for now, clearly profit-making and gentrifying purposes. Indeed, if you Google Hamilton House, if you type it into Google, the first web page is a site by uh, activists saying, don't go to Hamilton House. <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, and this is... Um, OT301 in Amsterdam, um, a building that was, again, it was squatted by artists in the early 1990s, not unlike the place in Berlin. Um, in 2006, uh, they collectively managed to kind of buy the building, and while some critics will kind of point to its kind of clean anarchy look, and perhaps its kind of more corporatized underbelly, um, it is still being run by a collective, and it does try to maintain their kind of subcultural creative practices. Um, it's a, often they often hold... Um, semi-illegal raves and things like that, but time will tell. Time, uh, yeah, will tell if they are able to stay true to their original squatting ethic. Um, but again, I, I, I put these in just to sort of say there are kind of shades of grey to this art washing process. Um, it's not as black and white, I think, as people like to make out, as some people on Twitter like to make out anyway. Um, but I think what is not in any doubt is that this creative city discourse, the one that attempts to use art washing and all the other tools at its disposal has become a unidirectional and homogenous policy tool. Uh, as I say, one that is almost exclusively uh, done to maintain the kind of gentrifying process. And I think to break free from this kind of thinking, this kind of urban creativity is very difficult, and one might even say it's impossible. But the very fact that there have been victories, that capitalist versions of the city have receded and given way to subversive public and or marginal voices and places proves that there is a radical creativity is anything but impossible. Um, so as Boltansky and Chiapello argue in their 2005 book, The Spirit of New Capitalism, um, the current doctrine of creativity allows capitalism to disarm its critics by offering them excitement, stardom and financial rewards uh, that come from succumbing to a market-based competitive system. It claims resistance as its own, and the process, and in the process, it strips uh, any kind of anti-capitalist ethics from it, as this particularly crass example from the late Karl Lagerford shows with his protest chic. Um, what, it's, what this kind of stuff does is it calms the agitating forces, it slowly chips away at stubbornness, it glorifies particular aesthetics of counterculture, and it argues that messages uh, can be amplified if only they use market mechanisms. But in doing all this, capitalism sort of stabilizes the ground beyond itself. These rewards, they very rarely materialize, or if they do, they are short-lived uh, and limited to the very few carefully selected individuals, and the rest of us are left on the margins, exploited and dispossessed, and the cycle starts all over again. To me, this is not creativity, and this is why so many people, groups, and ideologies are against creativity, and why, indeed, I wrote a book called Against Creativity, because I guess we, they, are arguing for a more radical interpretation of creativity, one that works towards, I guess, the horizon of a possible impossibility beyond the injustices of capitalism. And they do this by destabilizing the ground and making it infertile to the seas of capitalism, not massively unlike this, this artwork here uh, produced in the wake of the Arab Spring. It's called The Sprouting of Revolutionary Fists by the Zoo Project. Um, of course, this is dangerous and tiring work. The violence that's inherent in the process of stabilizing the ground, things like precariousness, domicide, marginalization, disability, hypermediation, austerity, codification, atomization, gentrification, dispossession, and many, many more 
Creativity as preached by the capitalist dogma is enacting what Rob Nixon might describe as a slow violence that grinds down any other forms of societal organization under the chorus of there is no alternative. But there is. There is a radical revolutionary creativity out there which shows that there is an alternative. And there are many of them, in fact, some of which I've described today. I think capitalism's greatest lie is getting us to believe that the ground that it seeks to stabilize and profit from is barren and devoid of life. Um, in work, in people, in politics, and in the city, creativity is narrated uh, via capitalist ideology as the force that will change the world for the better. Don't believe this lie. Believe that creativity is about searching for and giving space to and trying to realize the impossible. Um, and as a brief pointer to that, and uh, I want to end with this quote from Calvino, uh, Invisible Cities, uh, which I think sums it up far more eloquently than, than I ever could. And he says this, he says, the inferno of the living is not something that will be if there is one. It is what is already here, the inferno where we live every day. There are two ways to escape suffering it. The first is easy for many, accept the inferno and become such a part of it that you can no longer see it. The second is risky and it demands constant vigilance and apprehension. Seek and learn to recognize who and what in the midst of inferno are not inferno, then make them endure and give them space. Um, I'll leave it there, thank you. <laughs>
we have recently seen in the Eurozone crisis and previously in the 2008 financial crisis, essentially the financial sector set global political economic policy and they've been doing so for the last 40 years of the neoliberal global revolution. In fact, no other sector more than the financial sector has had this incredible influence on politics, the way we live together, the way we distribute goods and services and organize society. But even more profoundly, financialization uh, um, seeps into or uh, trickles down through the rest of society as well, in the sense that today, increasingly more and more aspects of life are termed um, as uh, assets to be leveraged or as investments to be made. The example I often point to is um, housing, for instance, uh, and whole neighborhoods have been transformed from being a space to offer shelter and community to being a site for us to individually speculate on our individual futures uh, as a means for us to survive and withstand financialization. We Im engage in financialized behavior as a means to defend ourselves from financialization itself, thereby contributing, to, again, to financialization. Another example from the, um, probably more from the Anglophone world, is the, um, the financialization of universities, where once going to university, providing for university was seen as a social responsibility for all of the problems that that kind of notion of public responsibility might have had within a capitalist society. Today, increasingly, students are forced to go further and further into debt in order to buy a credential, essentially, a degree, that will then allow them to play uh, essentially a rigged market in order to try and get a job in an increasingly austere economy. So financialization trickles down throughout the whole fabric of society as well. Uh, but the other side, so, and, and it sort of transforms our imagination of uh, what we think is possible and what we think is desirable and how we even imagine our relationships to other human beings, to the natural world, etc. I've also, in other work, explored the kind of uh, flip side of this from the perspective of resistance and rebellion in a work that I did with my colleague Alex Kasnabich called uh, The Radical Imagination. And there we did a multi-year intensive ethnography of social movements in the small Canadian city of Halifax and sort of developed a methodology for thinking through what is this thing we would like to call the radical imagination? What does it promise us? Uh, what are some of the pitfalls? And, and importantly for us, how can we as academic activists, activists who are also academics or academics who are also activists, how can we in some way contribute to the radical imagination as well? How can we not just study it but work to activate it in some way? This research led me to my latest book, uh, which Paolo introduced at the beginning, Art After Money, Money After Art, Creative Strategies Against Financialization. And this book actually came out of the strange experience for someone who is trained in cultural studies, critical theory, and political economy of being hired in an art school, which in Canada is very rare to be hired in an art school. Uh, and I needed to find a way of talking about financialization and money and debt to my students in a way they would understand. And so uh, beginning in 2011, I started looking at the work of about, there's about 60 artists in the book, I think, all together, who in some way work with money in their creative artistic work. And, and I focus only on the critical artists who have some sort of critique to make of society and of capitalism, and I only focus on the good artists because there are many, many, many artists who work with money or finance or debt who do terrible work. And one of the interesting things about the book was asking this question, why is so much of the artwork about money or that uses money even in it, like coins and bills and bank cards and debt instruments, why is it so, so much of it so bad? And I have some theories, which I'm not going to share with you today, about why that might be. I wanted to share with you maybe the kind of key um, theoretical uh, argument of the book, which is that what we want to believe, the myth that we want to believe, is that uh, art has something to tell us about money and something to tell us about capitalism because they're so very far apart. You know, money represents everything that is profane, that is worldly, that is in fact wrong with the world over here. 
uh, you know, the realm of the barbarians. And then the realm of the angels over here is the realm of art. And so we have, you know, we, we project onto art in the Freudian sense, we project onto art all of the things that we want to believe are good about the human experience. Ingenuity, creativity, imagination, autonomy, um, et cetera, et cetera. But my argument in the book is that in fact these two myths hold each other in place, like a crypt. And here I borrow the metaphor from Jacques Derrida of the crypt, um, which he takes also from uh, Abraham Torok and uh, re-theorization of uh, Freud, Freud's um, discourse on the wolf man, so to speak. We don't need to go into the whole theoretical genealogy. The concept of the crypt is that you have, and in some ways it's a, one could even think about it as a, as a Derridian return um, to, the, to the Marxist dialectic in a certain sense. But in any case, the crypt is a structure, as you know, given that Rome is full of crypts, uh, that is uh, made up of archways and interconnected archways. So an archway, of course, is an architectural form where two opposing forces hold up a cavity underneath, hold up a space that's empty underneath. And my argument is that ultimately, metaphorically speaking, art and money hold up together one another in a kind of escalation, in a kind of uh, building or construction, uh, theoretically and sociologically speaking. And that in fact, they hold up each other as mythological constructs that do a kind of work for one another. So on the one hand, in order for us to think about money as this thing that's banal, that's boring, that has nothing to do with the imagination, we need to believe in art as something that totally captivates and captures the imagination. And similarly, for us to have the modern idea of art, which is to say art as a form of unalienated labor, art as a form of the pure expression of the spirit, etc., etc., this kind of bourgeois enlightenment notion of art and the creative genius, in order for that myth to sustain itself, it rests on the myth of money, right? So that the, what is art? Art is not money. What is money? Money is not art. Uh, so that's kind of the key theoretical uh, supposition of the art after money, money after art book. And, but for this reason, I, I turn around and say, well, actually, this is probably why m art about money is so interesting. It's not because art is so far away from money and so allergic to money. No, it's actually because they're part of the same system. It's actually because they're supporting each other. And so therefore, the argument goes, if we look at the work that these artists are doing, not just in their artwork themselves, like the thing that they produce and they put in the gallery or that they stage as a performance, but in fact the ways in which the artist is working as a laborer, as a creative actor in the world. If we look at the, the form of those, those forms of work, then maybe we're gonna understand something about the deeper shifts and trends in our society towards financialization. And ultimately I come to the conclusion in that book that both art and money must be abolished. Um, and I mean this actually quite, quite literally. I do actually think that the, the categories of art and money need to be abolished. If we abolish art, then we let creativity free into society in the, in the ways that have been dreamed of by the avant-garde of the past. Uh, and similarly, if we abolish money, we would need to think again about how we are going to provide and provision for one another in society. Money ultimately is a means by which we coordinate our cooperation as a cooperative species. It's a means by which we organize goods and services. It's a means by which we come into relationship with one another in a society that's too large for us to imagine, a huge global society of seven billion people. We coordinate that society through money. But what other mechanisms can we use to organize ourselves. And I think Uli mentioned in his presentation a number of excellent experiments that are going on all around the world to organize social cooperation without money. So I believe in the abolition of these two categories. It doesn't mean no one's gonna be creative. It doesn't mean there'll be no imagination. I'm not talking about abolishing the creative spirit that animates all human beings and perhaps non-human beings as well. I'm speaking about abolishing the category and abolishing the myth, both art and money. So this has led me to my most recent work because in doing the research on financialization and resistance to financialization, I became increasingly interested in a certain problem that we have in understanding capitalism. And it's a problem that actually goes all the way back to Karl Marx, arguably before, which is it's very easy to become 
infatuated with the infernal machine of capitalism. It's very, uh, as, as a scholar, but also as activists and thinkers and compassionate human beings, it's easy to become obsessed with how beautifully the machine works. It's violent, it's bloody, but it is a beautiful machine. Capitalism, especially financialized capitalism that organizes our sensibilities, that organizes our social cooperation, has a kind of demonic clockwork to it. Um, and I myself have fallen prey to this temptation to understand it that way. But if you zoom out the lens a little farther, what you see about capitalism is actually, it's incredibly violent. It leaves most of humanity to die uh, in a form of sort of biopolitical capitalist abandonment, which is going to destroy the planet within our lifetimes if we don't stop it. Uh, capitalism is not only based on that, it's also based on these episodes, one after another after another, of brutal repression of people's struggles. And then there's all of the other forms of violence, such as the ones that Oli was mentioning in his presentation, of slow violence. These sorts of violence that capitalism undertakes that work on such a slow level that we almost don't see it happening, as compared to, for instance, the violence of the exploitation of the worker in the factory or of the child who's mining the materials for our phones in, you know, in the in Democratic Republic of Congo, et cetera, et cetera. And so for this reason, I began to, under, to undertake this new project called Revenge Capitalism. Uh, the subtitle is The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and the Settling of Unpayable Debts. And it's unpayable debts that I want to speak to you about um, in this presentation today. So there's sort of a few arguments in this book. The first is that we cannot understand the rise of what I call revenge politics today without understanding the form of financialized capitalism we live in. And I won't go into a huge definition of revenge politics for you because I think we all live with it at this moment. I would simply say it includes, but is not limited to, the rise of the far right and neo-fascist tendencies all around the world. It is linked to the way in which voters seem to vote against their own material interests simply as a form of revenge against some group. Sometimes it's called the elites, sometimes it's minority groups. We can look at the Brexit referendum in the UK as a good example, where most of the economic speculation is that this will in fact hurt the UK economy, and yet people voted for it. In any case, we could look at the election of Donald Trump in the United States as another form of revenge uh, politics. But there is also a revenge politics of the left as well, which I won't get into today, but. It's, it's important to think about. And I suggest we can't understand revenge politics now unless we understand revenge capitalism. Um, and by revenge capitalism, I mean a form or a moment, I should say, of capitalist accumulation on a global scale where the system begins to act irrationally, where that infernal clockwork or mechanism begins to seemingly act against its own interests. So one example is, for instance, the climate crisis. If you went around and asked business leaders uh, if they think this is a good idea, most of them say absolutely not. We've seen, for instance, the whole World Economic Forum, which is probably the world's leading gathering of business elites, uh, come out and suggest that they are now an ecological organization and an organization interested in human development and, uh, and, and, the, and fighting back against inequality. So there's a sense that even capitalist actors, capitalists themselves, realize that the capitalist system of which they're a part, but over which they feel individually that they have no control, is fundamentally broken. It's out of control. Another example of revenge capitalism I point to is the American example of mass incarceration, where today one in three black men in the United States will be incarcerated at some point in their life uh, with tremendously horrific effects on themselves and their whole communities. Another thought about revenge capitalism, which I'll talk about today, is debt and the, the growth around the world of debts that everybody acknowledges are never going to be paid back. They're unpayable debts, and I'll speak about this more in a minute. So in order to make these arguments, I try and theorize revenge again, uh, and where I sort of end up is suggesting that, uh, with this kind of dialectic, um, 
Revenge is what the powerful name the oppressed people's calls for justice. That's what revenge is. Revenge doesn't refer to anything specific. It's when people in power identify the oppressed as when they rise up, then the powerful say, ah, they're just a vengeful mob. They're just a mass of vindictive people who are living for nothing except their bitterness and resentment against us. So revenge, in a certain sense, in the way I'm framing it in the book, is a bit of a myth as well. Conversely, the second part of this argument is that um, revenge is actually not what we like to think about. And I mean revenge here in a very political, political economic sense, in the sense of talking about financialization. Of course, there's a long cultural history of revenge in every civilization. I'm speaking only in a very limited way about revenge in our moment as a structural and systemic force. So, the other side of it is that revenge is the action that is undertaken by the powerful in order to perpetuate or uh, implement their power. So I think the best place to look for this is the colony, right? So in the situation of a colonial atmosphere, based on a racist logic of Eurocentric domination, the uh, colonized people are held or are believed by the elites, uh, the colonial elites, to be pathologically vengeful, to be filled with bloodlust. And that's why they can't be trusted to uh, take power or to rule themselves. At the same time, colonialism as a structure and a system is held in place purely by acts of revenge. It may think it's educating, it may think it's enlightening, it may think it's protecting. That's all nonsense. It's actually just an uh, archipelago of acts of revenge that then disguise themselves as justice or disguise themselves as civilization and then blame the oppressed for the vengefulness. This is the general argument of the revenge book. So one part of this book on revenge, then, is about unpayable debts. Um, and, uh, oh, I should say the last, the last aspect of the revenge book is I try and make a distinction. And I, I, I've never been clear. Maybe we can talk about this afterwards if this distinction makes sense uh, outside of English. I try and make a distinction between, on the one hand, revenge, which I've spoken about here in this dialectic form I've mentioned, and then what I call avenging. And uh, it's, a, it's a subtle distinction, but my argument is that uh, avenging rather than revenge is a way of thinking about how social movements and uh, groups of oppressed people claim a debt from below, claim an unpayable debt from below upon the system that is destroying them. So I think about avenging as the way that movements make a demand on the system that the system cannot meet, that it cannot repay. And I'll, I'll get to this a little bit later in the discussion of unpayable debts here in a second. So this notion of uh, unpayable debts then builds on the work of theorists who many of you are probably familiar with, including David Graeber, the anthropologist, uh, Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, the, the philosopher. And Lazzarato himself builds upon the legacy of Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the 19th century philosopher, all of whom generally argue that we need to detach debt from any sense that it represents a moral obligation. People are in debt largely, not because they did something wrong and they spent too much money, blah, blah, blah. This goes for whole nations as well. Certain nations and certain people are in debt because their debt is a signifier of their oppression or subjugation within a system. The debt, in a certain sense, comes later. We like to imagine that first there was a debt and then comes oppression and subjugation. But no, according to these theorists, ultimately, and it's to simplify both of their work quite a bit, the oppression comes first, and then the debt comes second. The debt is a way of justifying the oppression or the um, exploitation after the fact. So debt, in another sense, is a, is a form of power. And increasingly today, it's a form of biopolitical power. That is to say, it's a form of power that seeks to act on the very life of a person or on the very life of a people. And we need to look no further than the ways in which debt is being used today and has been used arguably through the, the whole history of modernity, but definitely since the end of the Second World War, as a means to extort and oppress whole populations. 
Recently, of course, this has happened in what has been rebranded as the European periphery. Uh, but of course, long before these debt policies of the International Monetary Fund or the Troika were applied to the European periphery, they were first applied to the so-called third world. And in fact, the whole history of the latter part of the 20th century and really the American empire is defined by its use of debt to crush anti-colonial rebellions or to co-opt or undermine anti-colonial and post-colonial uh, nation states. And we can also see this more generally in the lives of every individual, where in a financialized society, debt has become a key means by which we work biopolitically to make a life for ourselves. I gave the examples before of uh, education and housing as financialized realms. This is an example of how debt uh, works biopolitically to take control over our lives. And so, um, when I think about debt, and, and here's actually a, an interesting graph of the growth of global forms of debt over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, when I think about debt, I'm thinking here about a form of revenge that the system is taking upon us. It justifies itself as justice, as the balancing of scales. It justifies itself in a moral rhetoric that the debtor has to repay the debt that they incurred, that somehow the debtor has hurt or taken or away from the creditor, that they've deprived the creditor of their money or whatever. But of course, that's not what's actually going on. Underneath the surface, debt acts as a form of continual vengeance or revenge of the powerful upon the oppressed. Um, as I mentioned, the template of this is the colony. And I, I turn in the book to the work of Sadia Hartman, the black diaspora theorist, who talks about the way that after the American Civil War and the abolition of slavery, um, the freed uh, black people of the United States were encumbered uh, and re-enslaved in many ways by debt. So she speaks on a material level of the way that uh, freed people, as she calls them, freed people had no land, they had no wealth, they had been slaves for the last uh, several generations. Uh, those claims from the Union Army to compensate them and to give them, as is famously said, 40 acres and a mule were betrayed. And as a result, very quickly after, um, uh, after ab the abolition of slavery, many black people in the United States found themselves working often on the very same plantations from which they had freed themselves uh, as debt peons now, as indentured servants essentially. Others found themselves caught up in a new wave of criminalization where actions like being a vagabond, not having a fixed address, uh, insulting a white person were crimes that could be punished by incarceration. And under the 13th Amendment in the United States, slavery was still allowed for incarcerated people. So Hartman points out that debt replaced slavery. But she also points out that one of the most interesting aspects of the new indebted freed uh, black people in the United States after abolition was that they were also uh, burdened with a moral debt as well, which was to say that in the eyes of the dominant or hegemonic white society, it was told to them that they were indebted to the very people who had enslaved them or who had profited from their enslavement for now freeing them. And in fact, there was a great moral burden put on black people to suggest that they, their responsibility was to succeed in American capitalism when in fact all forms of support were withheld from them. Okay. I'm going to pause for a second for the translator to catch up. So the example of uh, slavery in the United States, I think, and the aftermaths of slavery give us an indication of what, in its, its purest form, debt from above looks like, debt as a form of revenge. Debt from below, on the other hand, takes different forms. As I mentioned, debt from below, or an avenging debt, as in contrast to a revengeful debt, uh, is one that makes a claim for a compensation or for a, a payback um, that can't be met within the order of justice of the oppressor 
And the most famous example from the era of slavery and abolition is the Haitian Revolution of the early 19th century in which the enslaved people of Haiti liberated themselves from French domination through a revolution and then successfully fought off the French, the English, the Spanish, and eventually the Americans who all attempted to um, re-enslave them. And in this incredibly bloody revolution, I mean, it was a horrific revolution filled with acts of revenge uh, from all sides, there emerged a sense that the, um, the Haitian people who had liberated themselves from slavery were demanding a form of justice that couldn't be encompassed within the colonial logic of racial supremacy. It was demanding citizenship for all people um, and many of the same principles that would, were also being espoused in the French Revolution. They were demanding also reparations for slavery, payment for slavery, uh, for the, the labor that they had contributed to the French and colonial economy. But it, again, there was a form of counter-revenge here too, because after the revolution was successful, all of these imperial powers conspired together uh, to make Haiti repay a massive debt to their former owners, to the slave owners, and compensate them for the loss, essentially, that they had of liberating themselves through revolution. And that debt, in fact, has carried through in one way or another all the way to the 21st century, where Haiti, in spite of once being the richest colony in the Caribbean, is today the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So in the remainder of the time today, I want to go over three art projects that have to do with our age of unpayable debts, uh, our age of financialization, which is so defined by two kinds of debts that can never be repaid. The one are the forms of unpayable debts that are imposed by the powerful, and then underneath that and hidden ultimately, underneath the dominant discourse and the dominant political economy are debts that cannot be repaid but that are being reclaimed through activism and through um, forms of resistance as well. So on the one hand, a debt of revenge by the system on people, on the other hand, an avenging debt that is claimed by the oppressed. The first example is uh, called Pocket Money Loans. It's by a British artist named Darren Cullen, who has been um, uh, active with this work since 2012. And it takes the form, as you see here at uh, the Glastonbury Music Festival, of setting up these temporary satirical uh, payday loan shops for children. Um, the idea here is that children don't have access to money in our society because they don't work, unless children have a very rich family and they get some sort of allowance from them, I don't know. Uh, and therefore, there's a market opportunity, a creative market opportunity, we might say, for an enterprising entrepreneur to set up a bank specializing in offering super high interest loans to children. Uh, and Cullen has appropriated two kind of visual languages here. One is the visual language of advertising to children, which is very familiar to us from television, magazines, etc., cetera, uh, toy stores. The other visual language he's appropriating is that of payday loans lenders, especially in the UK, where very, very high rates um, loans are offered to poor people, essentially as a means to, to quote unquote, help them uh, survive economically in austere times. These are often forms of uh, debts that include a 5,000% rate of annual interest, to give you a sense of what these look like. Um, so for, uh, for Cullen, he's, he's working with these visual languages, but he's also then working with a series of deep ideological ideas and understandings. One of them is that, of course, in the United Kingdom right now, where Cullen is active and to which the work refers, rates of child poverty are disgustingly high. Uh, Britain is, of course, one of the richest countries in the world. It once oversaw a vast global empire. 
uh, child poverty rates today, by most estimates, hover around 30%. So one in three children in England live in poverty. You can see the, the statistics here. So on the one hand, Cullen, like many great interventionist artists, is drawing attention to something that is hidden that people don't want to see, but is, of course, a reality. On another level, Cullen's work is functional socially because of a certain fetishization that is present around the figure of the child within capitalism. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman, the famous uh, Polish and English sociologist, spoke about the way that moral panics are often fixated on the figure of the child. And likewise, the uh, education theorist Henry Giroux has spoken about the fetishization of the image of the child as this purely innocent being. And Giroux has pointed out that this notion of the child as a pure, innocent being Yes, it, to a certain extent, it comes from Christian theology, but to a very real extent, it was created as a means to transform children from workers, which is good, they shouldn't be workers, but into consumers. For instance, through the kind of mythology propounded by the Walt Disney Corporation and the idea of a magical, enchanted childhood. Uh, of course, it goes back earlier to the 19th century as well, but it's important to recognize that within capitalism, there's a very particular fetishization of the figure of the child as completely innocent, as a, as a figure who stands outside of capitalism. Um, Lee Edelman, the American queer theorist, has spoken about the, the fetishization of the child as being about a kind of toxic reproductive futurism, as he calls it, which is a sense that all of society becomes oriented towards uh, a notion of the future that keeps us trapped in a toxic present, essentially. Uh, a sense of the future is coming, the future will be better for our children, we have to think about the children, blah, 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 blah. But of course, this keeps us in a state of immobility, in a certain sense. And my friend and colleague, Lee Claire Leberge, has also spoken in her recent excellent book called Wages for Artwork, about uh, artists who use children in their work precisely because children cannot be paid under this moment of capitalism, precisely because they cannot be paid, they become a useful mechanism for artists to begin to speak about the inequalities of global capitalism. On a deeper level, the figure of the child as it relates to financialization and in this work speaks to a kind of perversion of a fundamental debt. Human beings, uh, notoriously, take a very long time to become, quote unquote, independent. In fact, humans never become independent. We are a social species, and we always have been. But for a child to be able to allegedly survive alone takes roughly, depending on what you believe, between 10 and 18 years which is singular for any species on Earth, even species that are much larger than us, like elephants and whales. So there's a sense that the child is always born into a kind of debt, right? They're always born into a debt to their family, to their community. We rely as children on our communities in order to survive and to raise us, and therefore we pay off that debt through the rest of our lives. And many different civilizations have had different narratives to explain this form of generative debt, or social bonds, if you prefer. The exploitation of children as debtors today, uh, in, and that is uh, sort of satirized by Cullen, uh, speaks to the way in which this intergenerational debt has been profoundly perverted. And the way that, again, capitalism, financialized capitalism specifically, reaches deep into the bios itself, reaches deep into the realm of biopolitical production, into the realm, if you prefer, of social reproduction, as theorized by Nancy Fraser or Silvia Federici. Uh, Veronica Gago of Argentina, a great theorist, has recently been writing a lot about how, uh, from a feminist perspective, debt is a means to take command over the realm of social reproduction, not just the reproductive capacity of women's bodies, but the broader field of reproduction as well which is to say the raising and caring for children, the reproduction of community. 
So debt, in a certain sense, is this mechanism by which capitalism reaches into the fabric of society, into the realm of social reproduction. And this helps us understand why our, our breath catches at the idea that, um, that uh, Cullen is presenting in this work, um, that we should give payday loans to children. But the irony is, if indeed we believe that children should have this magical childhood, that they should have this moment of pure innocence, that they should have what they want, that they should enjoy, that they should be perfect consumers without having to be workers. If we believe that, which is our general societal belief, then why not give them loans? Why not give every child a million euros today? Because ultimately, as soon as they go to university, as soon as we arbitrarily determine they're an adult, in Anglophone societies and in England, they're going to go hundreds of thousands of euros into debt, every stage of their life afterwards is going to be debt. So why not allow children to take on debt in childhood, if indeed we believe the mythology that children should have this magical realm? The argument here is that ultimately it's absurd, but it points to a deeper abs absurdity, which is that adulthood is so de determined by financialization and debt that we have to maintain this mythology of the child as a kind of um, sacrament uh, and as a kind of indulgence uh, to ourselves as a society. But the problem is the more we obsess over the child as this figure of financial innocence, the more we condemn ourselves to the hell that they are apparently avoiding. I'll talk about just one more piece today, uh, which is uh, Marta Minuchin's uh, Payment of Greek Debt to Germany with Olives and Art. This is performed, this was the opening act of Documenta 14 in Athens in 2017. So uh, what you see before you is Marta Minuchin, uh, the Argentinian pop artist on the right, and a Angela Merkel impersonator on the left. And they're seated in front of a huge bath of uh, black olives. Um, and in this performance, uh, which, I think this is a terrible work, so I'm just gonna preface my comments by saying that. Uh, in this performance, they talk, and Angela Merkel gives a speech, and then Minuchin offers, uh, sorry, Minuchin uh, offers her a handful of these olives as a way of repaying Greece's debt to the EU, but more specifically to Germany. Uh, of, you know, and, and there's all sorts of problems with the way this is being framed. Um, of course, I don't need to go into detail for you about the Greek debt crisis over the last uh, decade, really, um, and the way in which that's led to the imposition of truly catastrophic austerity on the nation of Greece and other places in the so-called European periphery, as it has been rebranded. Um, one thing I will mention is that very early on in the Greek debt crisis, internal documents from the International Monetary Fund already were stating that Greece's debt was unpayable. It was impossible to repay this debt. No matter what Greece did, no matter how many cuts were made, without incredible economic growth that, would, uh, that could be facilitated only through deficit spending, could Greece actually grow enough to be able to pay off its debt. And yet the decision was made, arguably, according to many, largely in Germany or its peripheries, and largely in the offices of Deutsche Bank, uh, that this debt would be paid in spite of the fact that it was unpayable and in spite of the sociological effects it would have on the Greek people. Um, and so this was all in the context that Minuchin, uh, Minuchin sorry, was, was performing this opening act, a context which Minuchin understood, I think, very little. I think Minuchin had read a few newspaper headlines and decided to do a work which was in fact a reproduction of a work she'd done earlier. This is uh, Marta Minuchin's uh, 1985 piece, The Repayment of the Argentine Foreign Debt to Andy Warhol with Corn, the Latin American Gold. Uh, and in this, uh, in this uh, piece, she and Warhol had a sort of photo opportunity in which uh, she essentially tried to repay the Argentine national debt, which had been incurred in the years following the dictatorship 
uh, the fall of the dictatorship there, uh, through Korn. And once again, there were a number of problems with the way she conceived of this. Corn does not actually originate from Argentina, so the idea that Argentina gave corn to the Americas, and this is a fundamental deep gift, which therefore should invalidate contemporary debts, is somewhat dubious. Argentina is also a settler colony. It wasn't the Argentine people who invented corn, it was the indigenous people who bred it over many generations, and presumably the indigenous people of Mexico, not of Argentina, in any case. So it's strange that she would presume to be able to offer this commodity as a means of repayment. And more strange still that she would offer it as Argentina's leading pop art star to America's leading pop art star as somehow a representative, I suppose, of the American empire or a neighbor of Wall Street. So already there's something kind of funny about this piece but there's something that doesn't quite work in the actual logic of debts as they actually exist. Um, so, oh, one moment here. Uh, it was also reprised a couple of years later in an even more confusing performance called uh, Resolving the International Conflict with Corn, the Latin American Gold, in which she hired a Margaret Thatcher impersonator Strangely, however, because the Falklands War between Argentina and the UK had been over for many years by that time, and Margaret Thatcher was no longer in power. But in any case, this gives you a sense of the, the sort of genealogy of this work that Minuchin is doing on this unpayable debt. Uh, Minuchin at Documenta 17 also created, so Documenta 17 was singular in the history of Documenta, which is an arts festival organized and funded by the German government and a large endowment uh, that happens every five years and whose mission is to showcase global contemporary art. Uh, it's usually held every year in Kassel, in part as the founder discussed it as a kind of global apology for the enthusiasm with which the uh, Kassel uh, and, and the province of which it's a part, adopted Nazism uh, in the 1930s and 40s. He wanted to create this kind of global art spectacle to confront this dark legacy. Uh, Minuchin staged uh, this Parthenon of books, which is made up of a kind of skeleton of the Parthenon, uh, which then people hang books that at some point have been banned or forbidden. Now this work was installed in Kassel in Germany in 2017 to a great deal of fanfare. It went way over budget, which I'll get, come back to in a minute. But it itself was a restaging of another piece that she did in uh, 1983 at the conclusion of the um, dictatorship in Argentina, which was another Parthenon of books, which had a great deal more resonance with people because throughout the dictatorship they had been uh, not allowed to have a great many books that they'd kept hidden in their homes. And this was a time for the whole community to come out and put their books together uh, in this spectacle. It didn't work as well the previous year, or at, sorry, in, in, uh, at Documenta, uh, where only, this is actually a graphic representation, it's not the actual thing, only about 10 to 15% uh, of the Parthenon was filled by books. So Minuchin has a kind of strange legacy of recycling these works that are about debt or about past trauma, uh, but that don't quite work in the new contexts. And the new context in Germany is one in which the Documenta uh, of, of 2017, Documenta 14, came under a huge amount of pressure from the far-right Alternative for Deutschland party, who claimed that it was a waste of public money and an insult to the German people especially uh, this piece, uh, Olu Uguibe's um, Monument for Strangers and Refugees, which the AfD uh, political party successfully got removed from the main square of Kassel because it uh, in some way seemed to contribute to what they considered to be an insult about uh, Germany's policy around refugee resettlement. So Minuchin in this piece attempts to speak to an unpayable debt, the unpayable debt of Greece, and she attempts to counter the unpayable debt that is imposed by the Troika, the IMF uh, and the European Commission and the European Union on Greece by speaking about a deeper debt, something that is owed to Greece uh, by Europe, which is to say olives and art. And there's a number of problems with this perspective. The first is, of course, it might be symbolically 
uh, kind of um, redemptive on a certain level, but materially it makes no difference. And many people and many Greek art critics were quite angry that Mnuchin would kind of fly in as an international art star and essentially make what seemed like a very um, ultimately silly gesture that capitalized, in fact, uh, on their misery, on the complete defunding of everything in Greece, including the arts, uh, where Mnuchin sort of got to come in without having really studied the situation very closely and make a spectacle that ultimately would serve her and serve the German curators, uh, or it's a Polish curator of Documenta, the sort of international art world, more than the people of Greece. Um, but second of all, the notion that the Europe owes a great debt to Greece that can never be repaid for culture and art is something that within Greece you would only hear from Golden Dawn essentially, from the neo-fascist party, who beats the drum of this great pride in ancient Greek culture and seeks to draw a direct line from ancient Greece to the present in order to refound a hyper-masculinist, neo-fascist uh, regime. So in a way, according to many critics in Greece, Mnuchin's piece actually contributed to a cultural discourse that's more friendly to authoritarianism than it is to some notion that ultimately this unpayable debt should therefore cancel or at least mobilize people around um, some better notion of debt forgiveness. So a final word on the abolition of unpayable debts, very briefly. We live in a world of unpayable debts. These unpayable debts take a revenge upon whole populations and people. This much I've already argued. Um, what's going to happen? Well, every empire that has succeeded has a found a way at some point of forgiving debts or eliminating debts or abolishing debts because at a certain point it becomes intolerable and the continued extortion of populations for unpayable debts ultimately leads to uprisings and revolutions. We may be seeing this on two or three different fronts today, I think. On the one hand, we are seeing radical and revolutionary movements arising some of them are radical and revolutionary movements that I'm sympathetic with, that are struggling for freedom and autonomy and equality. But we have to be honest with ourselves that most of the radical movements today are from the far right. Um, and these movements have not yet ad necessarily adopted a rhetoric of debt elimination or debt forgiveness or debt refusal. But I think very soon that they will. Uh, and they will use that debt forgiveness or refusal or elimination as a means to put forward increasingly xenophobic and uh, racist ideas. And I'll give you an example from the United States. If in his desire to seek re-election, uh, Donald Trump said that he was going to eliminate the household debts of homeowners who had never been incarcerated, you would have a massive, effectively a massive increase in white wealth in the United States that would likely win him a second term, if not the laurels of empire and forever rule. Um, so there's a way in which the right can very easily reappropriate this. I think you've seen it in Italy with the way in which the right has been friendly to notions of a basic guaranteed income as well. Not to say that there's, that's an idea that should be thrown out, but we are seeing a moment where far right uh, mobilizations are capable of also recognizing what's happening and developing their own political ideas and repertoires around it. At the same time, I think that there are movements afoot, and I, I don't have time to go into them necessarily, that are building these forms of debt elimination from below, that are saying we owe you nothing, that we won't pay, and I think within the next 10 years we will see increasingly uh, those movements become major forces, but what will make them successful is if they take not just a logic of walking away from the debt, but what I call an avenging logic, which is to say not only do we owe you nothing, you owe us everything, which was a slogan of Occupy Wall Street, actually, uh, a certain segment of Occupy Wall Street at one time, which is to say as workers who have led uprisings in the 19th and 20th century noted, it is not that we're seeking a bigger share of the pie, we're seeking the whole bakery. It's, this is our world that we've created through our labor and cooperation and you have no right to withhold it from us. I think similarly movements against debts and unpayable debts that come in the near future are not only gonna demand the elimination of the debts, 
they're also going to say that the system of power, which has been acting vengefully upon us, is in debt to us. And more importantly than that, that that debt can never be repaid. Because you can never repay a debt fully in the same coin that was minted from that debt. And this is, I think, the lesson of, uh, the, of the Haitian Revolution and others, that when you have a truly revolutionary movement that seeks to upend and un un undermine the existing system, you make a claim on a debt that the system can never repay because its form of money, its forms of currency, its forms of wealth have no meaning in the world that you want to create. They're forms of uh, expropriation that you've experienced that took revenge upon you will not be possible in the future that you want to make. And I think that's the key to the new politics of debt forgiveness if they're going to come from a truly radical and liberationist perspective. Thanks. This, this is water inside. <laughs>